Dobrý deň. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marta Šimečková. Welcome back to Astorka Theater. We are happy to be back. I also want to welcome you on behalf of the entire team, Andrea, uh, Lutska, Mario. We've been looking forward to meeting you for the entire last year. But before I hand over to Chris Kilmans, uh, let me say a few words about uh, him. Uh, after nine years, we have realized that the moderators uh, should uh, introduce all the guests, but nobody says anything about moderators themselves. Uh, Chris Kilmans is one of the uh, key figures of the Central European Forum for a number of years. His uh, position is of great importance because because he is the one who uh, puts together everybody on the podium. He is a writer um, and um, uh, also a uh, And I also would like to welcome two more people who have established something that we refer to in Slovakia, something like the cross... Berlentauch. Uh, no. Berlentauch. And um, uh, so we have Anja Zilliger here again. And... Uh, they inspired the Salon and the Central European Forum. Thank you and welcome, Ter. We are very happy to have all our panelists today. And uh, with this, I would like to welcome Chris Kalamans. Dobre popoludnie, dámy a páni. I am very, very happy to be back at the Central European Forum again this year. I find this an extraordinary gathering of committed people, intelligent people, brave people, young and old. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be here every time over the past five years. So now we're heading for two and a half hours of very, very serious content. We will speak about the main theme of this year's forum, how a good person turns evil. And we have six very good persons who will be joining us here on stage. All of them have seen evil in the eye. We hope that their insights and experience will, will guide us through one of the most terrifying phenomena that we experience today. That is how people can be normal citizens, regular citizens one day and turn into a aggressive and violent mass the next. So how does that work? What does it take to create such a phenomenon? Do we have that evil in ourselves, all of us? And if so, what can we do about that? Can we resist? That is what we'll speak about. And I think um, we have a few of the people here who from a wide range of perspectives can approach this question. So that is why I would like to introduce a format for this afternoon that's a little bit different than usual. I will not ask everybody, all six of these people, on stage at the same time. We will introduce them one by one. So, in order to, to make it possible for people to have uh, uh, concentrated conversations um, and not the, the sometimes scattered result if you have six such brilliant but very diverse people at the same time. I hope that'll work. It also means that I will be keeping track of the time. And our first guest, our most 
respected and honorary guest today is Avishai Margalit, who will open the, the, the conversation. I will introduce him in a minute. After that, in order of, of appearance, we'll have Michal Havran from Batislava. We'll have Keith Lowe from London. We'll have a short break then. And then we'll have Haris Pashovic from Sarajevo, Rasha Khayat from Hamburg, and Hamid Ismailov from formerly Uzbekistan, now uh, living in London. So, Avishai Margalit. Many of you will know him, many of you might have read his work. He's a professor emeritus in philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Among his many and, and, and very, very valuable guiding books are The Decent Society from about 20 years ago, Occidentalism, The West in the Eyes of Its Enemies, written together with Ian Burma, On Compromise and Rotten Compromises, and his new book, Betrayal, which was published earlier this year. Professor Margalit, anybody who's read his work knows he has this, this crystalline mind. It's incredibly lucid. He has a very commanding style of writing, which is at the same time very welcoming. He takes you with him on every step of the arguments he builds. He lays down his arguments through stories that he takes from history, from his own life, from literature. And in the introduction to this forum, I read that evil can become common in our lives when we lose the capacity to found internal conversation with oneself. And when I read Avishai Margalit's work, that is exactly what I see, a profound internal conversation with oneself. So I am very honored to invite Avishai Margalit on stage. Professor Margalit has been walking the streets of Bratislava all day, so he deserves a glass of water. <laughs> to begin with, Professor Margalit, um, I suppose you accepted the invitation to be here, partly because of the theme, because of the central question that we're tackling today. How does a good person turn evil, and I would like you to, to, I would like to ask you if you, if you agree, if you have the same sense of urgency that speaks from this introduction, I'll quote a short paragraph from that. At this moment too, we are living at a time of enormous upheavals. The present day upheavals, just like those of the 20th century, are related to the great loss of certainty brought about by the triumph of globalization. Over the past months and years, public discourse has shed all its inhibitions with politicians and aspiring politicians teaching us to see other groups of people as a mass, as a burden, as a potential threat, thereby preparing us and themselves, consciously or unconsciously, to stop seeing them as human beings. Well, in a way, fascinated <clears throat> to the topic of evil like all of us, and that's really a worry of mine. Because I think there is a tendency to glorify evil and aestheticize it. And therefore, even the word has 
is an underpinning, a metaphysical underpinning of the diabolical, the satanic, that comes from a religious worldview. And we invest evil with supernatural traits. And there is a real fascination with evil. And I always was struck by the fact that I was utterly captivated by Dante's Inferno and bored stiff with his paradise. Mm. That the good is somehow boring and evil is interesting. Or in the Tolstoy sense, I mean, there is variety in e of evils and unity of the goodness. And therefore, people, I think, especially in literature, there is a danger of romanticizing an idea of evil by making it, giving it an aesthetic quality. I remember a woman telling about a, her first encounter with Mengele in Auschwitz. She somehow survived. How beautiful he was with his white SS uniform. As a doctor, he had a special uniform and how they were all in tatters and shabby. And he looked sort of supreme, the prince of darkness, but aesthetically so. So I think there is a danger really underlying the word evil. And some, there are people even prefer, let's talk about badness. Badness is bad enough. And evil has this extra mm -hmm. uh, quality of it. But I think that uh, evil, I think, underlies something really important, that there is a qualitative difference between things ordinarily which are just bad and evil which calls for a different account. Yep. So, this fascination for evil, yes, I think many of us will recognize that. Now, this forum dedicates this year's edition completely to this question. Because the organizers and a lot of people like myself believe that it is more urgent than it has been in a long time to put that question on the table today. Do you sense the same thing, the sense of outrage, of alarm, of... The answer, the short answer is yes, and the long answer is too long even for this session. Mm. <laughs> the, I think we feel, or at least people of certain age, that there is a sense of going back to the early 30s. Mm -hmm. It's something that dark clouds are clattering mm -hmm. all over that what, what looked like a tri liberal triumphalist approach. Fukuyama even celebrated that's the end of history. That, that's rubbish. Mm -hmm. that it's, a thi it's thin and it's really under attack. Mm -hmm. And it's under attack in places that echoes terrible things that later on happened in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, the fear is real. And I don't think it's exaggerated. But uh, I, not that I believe that sort of Nazism is on the rise tomorrow, but something menacing is, is approaching. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand, and in that sense, I share completely the sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Must be sad, for you, though, to return to this region in this atmosphere, because you told me that you have been living and teaching in Prague at the Central European University when it was established there, shortly after the Velvet Revolution. And that must have been a very different time, very different atmosphere. And I stumbled on this short quote from your book, The Decent Society, from 20 years ago. And I'll read this because it, it might be interesting to go back to that, especially now that we're um, here. I distinguish 
you write, between a decent society and a civilized one. A civilized society is one whose members do not humiliate one another, while a decent society is one in which the institutions do not hum humiliate people. Thus, for example, one might think of communist Czechoslovakia as a non-decent but civilized society, while it's possible to imagine without any contradiction a Czech Republic which would be more decent but less civilized. 20 years later, how do you look back on that? With uh, pride and sadness. Mm. Namely, I think it turned out to be right. And, uh, so my vanity is flourishing. Mm. Uh, and yet, sadness that it so happened and that it, it didn't develop into a decent and civilized society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's. I think that's an apt description, yes. Mm -hmm. Later on, we'll probably hear more, for instance, from Michal Havram about how he sees that today. Uh, but you, from, from a distance, um, you, you, you get the feeling that Czech Republic, or maybe Slovakia as well, nowadays is neither decent nor civilized society? No, I wouldn't say that it's indecent, but I think the promise, there was a promise there. I was in, I used to come to the, when the Central European University was in Prague, I used to come, I came there for three successive or four successive years for two, three weeks in the winter. Mm -hmm. And the students were from all former Soviet block mm -hmm. and uh, there was a sense of optimism and something new is arriving and I was there when the split between Slovakia the secession if you want between Slovakia and the Czech Republic took place with no violence so in that sense it was impressive as, a, as an outsider, I, I didn't see why the secession. Mm -hmm. Although I come from an area where nationalistic feelings are not unrecognized. I know it all too well. But, uh, but I thought that, and I think that the Czech attitude was partly of obviously of superiority over the Slovaks, and even a glee or a menacing feeling, let them roll, make it on their own. Mm -hmm. And they were very surprised that Slovakia mm -hmm. did it, made it. So and in that sense, are. and it's, well, I'm here. So in that sense, it's an impressive achievement. Mm -hmm. It didn't look that way at the time, I mm -hmm. must admit, at least not to me. At the time, did you expect, did you see the potential for a decent society to arrive here after decades of a society where institutions did humiliate the citizens? Did you see the potential for a society arising here that you would call decent in that sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely thought so. And I thought that uh, <clears throat> people, that, that, I mean, the people who were so deeply humiliated uh, institutionally, namely that they found many of the institutions humiliating, that they will do better. Mm -hmm. And I think they did better, both here and in the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. but not, not to the high expectations that I had at the time, yeah. yes. This is, the one, this is one of the places where those expectations are still alive uh, and resilient, and that is beautiful, of course. Um, but this is also one of the countries in Europe and across the world where you could say that one of your 
let's say, warning signs um, has happened. Because you wrote at the time, I claim that a society is decent only if its hegemonic culture does not contain humiliating collective representations that are actively and systematically used by the society's institutions. And I get the feeling today in Europe and elsewhere, uh, this, these hegemonic cultures are trying to do exactly this, humiliating um, collectives, communities, groups, setting them outside of the dominant discourse. Yes, I remember. I mean, the statement you started, which was the statement to convene this gathering, mm. stress globalization. Mm. I would stress something very different, namely immigration. Mm -hmm. I believe that immigration will be the test of humanity in this century. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main we usually deal with politics or in more in the morality of politics with the distribution of resources in a given society whether it's just or unjust i think that this is a secondary question to the question who belongs to the society who is a member among whom do you allocate the resources? It's very clear that if someone is accepted as a member to Norway, is already better off than 90% of the world. So just by mere being a member there and being looked after the welfare state. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that the main problem, political problem, is membership. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that the world will be, at least in the foreseeable future, an international world and not a cosmopolitan world. Can no. you can you develop that difference? Yes, I don't. Well, I mean, the difference is that there is no politics to cosmopolitics. There mm -hmm. is no government, no army, no decision making, nothing. Still, we are in states, and many of them are nation states, and they are there to stay for a long time. Therefore, we have to talk about international relations and who will be members in the different states. Mm -hmm. I believe that issues that are so frightening now and that actually stir many of the fears that you mentioned has to do with immigration. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, uh, and therefore, it's not about just romanticizing the other and the brother and making the other a brother, or all those kitsch morality. The main thing is really a political issue for how we decide about membership mm -hmm. and what are the implications of taking people as members in the society. Mm -hmm. And I think this problem is with us, will be the main problem and the main test for liberalism in the coming years. Yes. Liberalism, I hear, talk in the very sort of wide sense, not just in, as a doctrinaire. Yeah. So how could, if you would, if you would uh, add a new chapter to the decent society today, focusing on this question of how to deal with the membership of a nation in a time of immigration? Well, Angela Merkel made something which I think was decent and brave in adopting and taking 800,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. But if you take Jordan, my next door neighbor, they took all, they took three and a half million from Iraq mm -hmm. in the war and from Syria and so on. And that's a tiny desert 
kingdom. Mm -hmm. And no one talks about it. Mm -hmm. They never got any, they didn't get brownie points on, on hospitality yeah. and on looking after from the meager resources. Although I believe the people there do not have the opportunity to become, let's say, officially members of the well, society. Well, it depends what. Palestinians from 48 and so on became full members in mm -hmm. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Actually, they are the majority of Jordan. Mm -hmm. The majority of Jordan are of sort of yeah. things. So, no, I mean, the point is there are 25 million people on the move in Africa now. They will, some of them will try to knock on the door of you, whether you want it or not. Either you make Africa prosperous enough and invest and do something about it, or you are going to face mm -hmm. this movement. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I mean, that's pretty clear. Yeah. Now, if you ask me, do I have a program, a universal program, what is the right way to deal with immigration? The answer is no. Do I have suggestion in specific cases? I think so. Mm -hmm. But uh, therefore, first we have to deal with immigration on a retail basis, place by case, case by case, mm -hmm. before we start generalizing and talking in great terms. And but. It's clear that uh, the hostility to immigration in many places that never saw an immigrant, not even remotely, that this moral panic mm -hmm. for immigration and the way that it captured the imagination of people, that's pretty frightening and that brings us very close to the imagination of evil. Right. Do you believe that people take that step out of fear, out of not knowing, out of anger, because they feel betrayed, the theme of your last book, because they feel betrayed in the myth of the nation or the myth of the society that they have belonged to, that the, the, the influx of immigrants feels like a betrayal to what we stand for, where we live. No, I think that in lots of places, popular sentiment is such that liberalism doesn't capture the imagination of people. Mm -hmm. It looks to them phony, an elite, an elite ideology imposed by the Supreme Court by constitutions, and these people are connecting with foreigners and minorities mm -hmm. against us, mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those leaders who speak for us as the people, namely the nativists, the people who really belong, the true people who stand for common sense and not for rubbish, mm -hmm. lofty, Ideals. This feeling. This is carrying on. This was. A, this happened in the 30s. It's happening now. Yeah. What is called? You can call it populism, soft fascism, whatever the term is. I think this is very strong. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we all talk about tr as if truth. I mean, the liberal talk as if truth vanished from the discourse for arguments or right that fake news and all this talk about that basically suddenly you blur and Trump is a representation of as if truth doesn't matter. You can contradict yourself as much as you, you want. Mm -hmm. You can get away with it. But people don't know that lots of his supporters believe that he's telling the truth, not in the sense of factual truth, that he expresses genuine feelings the feelings of resentment, the feelings of suspicion of the foreigners, and so on. They feel that he is really, that because of politically correct constraints and manners 
politically correct are the etiquette of the liberals. That's what they, and that's really restraining genuine expression of feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore they feel that now it's time to express what they really feel yeah. and what the true people feel against all those sort of eggheads who claim otherwise. So the clash is serious and I think it's all over. It was always there. But now, with a, as you said, with globalization, namely the fast move of commerce in the world, and now fast move of workforce, and the added quarter of a million people were added to the workforce in the world, in China and other places, now there is a serious problem, mm -hmm. very similar to the early 30s after the, an economic crisis. We are after an economic crisis in 2008. So it's not surprising that this kind of sentiment more than ideology is emerging and capturing mm -hmm. more and more people. And to, to round up this part of the talk, that brings us back to your first remark about the fascination for evil. At times like this, evil seems attractive. Is that what you mean? Evil seems attractive as a solution, as a way out, as a revolt. That's com evil is a, here is a paradoxical notion. Namely, can you act and do something because you believe the reason why you do it is because it's evil. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear that it makes sense that uh, doing the diabolical thing because it's diabolical. Mm -hmm. Even Lucifer, the falling angel, Milton and other accounts, is doing what he's doing as he's doing the evil thing as a rebellion against the good God. I can't stand anymore your goodness. So that's an expression of rebellion. Not even the, the, the Satan doesn't do it for its own sake. Mm. The point is, do you know cases that people, so you need for that really literature, Richard III, Iago, Calgart in uh, Melville's novel, or people, I mean, you need to create uh, cases. And, and it's very hard, as it is very hard even to explain. Not evil is hard to, to describe, and the goodness is hard to describe. Dostoevsky in, in, um, wanted to, to create a, a, a Jesus-like figure by Bishkin in, in, in the novel and said how difficult it was to him to describe someone good. Yeah. So though both those extreme, but I think in the diabolical case, there is an inherent contradiction. It's not mm -hmm. clear to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. that someone can do things because, because yeah. it's evil. Yeah. yeah. And that is why the politicians and aspiring politicians that were mentioned in the introduction are trying to sell evil as a good thing. Sure. Now let's invite our first next panelist on stage with you. I see a few people standing. There's chairs over here if you would like to, because we're going to be here for a while. So you're very welcome to move over here. Okay. Professor Margalit, you see what you said is true. Evil attracts people. No, it's all goodness. It's all goodness. All good people here. 
Now, um, let me introduce, if necessary, for the audience here, Michal Havran from Bratislava. You must, you must be familiar with his work. Writer, founder and editor-in-chief of the online current affairs website Yetotak. Um, he's a host on television. He's a writer. Recently, a uh, new collection of his essays and columns was published. Michal um, Havran. I have never been able to, to, to read enough of your work in English, and I still don't speak Slovak. But um, the titles of your both your essay books speak volumes. Foaming at the Mouth is one, and We'll String You Up is the most recent. So to me as an outsider, it doesn't look like, let's say, peaceful, harmonious uh, collection of work. And I found somewhere how you describe this country, and I would like you to to respond to Mr. Margalit's remarks of just now, after I quote this. About Slovakia, you write, it's a decomposed society which stopped believing in its internal coherence, a traumatized society increasingly closed into its own fears, and a cynical society which sees politics a soulless fight for personal profits. And that is just one quote. <laughs> listening to Avishai Margalit, um, listening to him remember the days when Czech Republic and Slovakia split, remembering the days that he saw the potential for a decent society where institutions don't humiliate its citizens, um, what were you thinking, listening to him coming from Slovakia? Dobrý den všetkým, děkuji pekně za... Budem hovorit. ...or polite man. Um, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's great honor and pleasure to be here today with you. And I have uh, some remarks about the question of evil, but uh, as you asked me about the uh, secession of Czechoslovakia, indeed it was extremely violent because we maybe didn't suffer from the violence of institutions, but we suffered the violence of our own history again. So. <clears throat> And the history is a special kind of institution uh, which um, uh, is still present in our cultural and political psyche. So um, at the very time, at early 90s, uh, compared what, to what was going on in Yugoslavia, of course we were kind of a moral winners in the, uh, in, the, in the eyes of the world, because we were not killing each, each other. But uh, compared to what we wanted to have in 89 in this country, we failed completely. And it was the very first founding fail of these two countries. And now you can find uh, all the symptoms and weaknesses and immoral decisions in politics in Czech Republic and in Slovakia. And if you track them down, you will still find a strange um, heritage of secession of Czechoslovakia. Because this kind of uh, historical violence without uh, uh, military or physical violence uh, uh, make, make us a kind of a political sect in Czechs and Slovak countries. And we learned that we can be violent to each other without... 
micro can be violent. Mm -hmm. We can be violent to each other in a, some very sophisticated way. So I don't need to kill you. I just can take you away your history and your family, mm -hmm. and it's it just enough. Mm -hmm. Mr. Margalit, Michal makes, makes an interesting uh, uh, remark there. He says, history is a special kind of institution. For your precise mind, is that something you could agree on? Well, I wrote a book which was called The Ethics of Memory, which, had to, which dealt exactly with this problem. I'm not here to advertise anything about <laughs> my books, but I mean, painful histories, shared painful histories between two ethnic groups or two nations we see now in Catalonia, in Spain, and the oppression there was serious, namely the oppression of the Catalans by Franco. And before, in the, I still have friends there who were punished severely for speaking in Catalan. And the only, the only hymn that they were allowed to, to sing was Barca, the, and the only flag was the Barca football flag. That was the only identification that there was allowed. And even that was a suspicion. And yet, and yet, I'm not sure that, I'm, that I support my friends there with a secession. As long as the reality that was created enabled them to create a f federation or and retain the culture, the language, and the thing that they met, matter most. I, that's, so his, your history I take seriously, but we cannot be victims of history. And I come from a place where we are victims of history, namely from my punished land, from Israel and Palestine. And history is really the, one of the main stumbling blocks that curbs any effort to create reasonable life. Mm -hmm. So the point is really not whether history counts, does, and I'm not one of those that only future-oriented reasons should be taken into account. The issue is the weight of history. And the point is that I think what we do see is that people are more and more in the grip of the history. And the imagination is an only historical imagination. And that, I think, is sad. Mm -hmm. I would say something else. Very sad. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. Michal Havran, um, Professor Margalit was describing this fascination for evil. It's as old as humankind, but, but it's very much alive today in our part of the world. Could you describe to Professor Margalit and to me and to you how this fascination for evil uh, takes shape in Slovakia today? I entered the theological seminary in France, and uh, I my first exam from with Professor Siegwald was uh, from moral theology, and for first uh, it was a winter semester, and uh, I pick up the question the. Or, the problem of Theodicias, of the existence of evil. And, and he like, I, I, picked the, I, picked the answer, uh, I picked the question and he told me like, you have like 15 minutes to tell me what, uh, where does the evil come? And I was like, this is the end, you know, like, I, 
And uh, then I put some remarks and he offered me a cigarette and a coffee and so let's talk about evil, when does it come, how does it work? And I tried to tell something and he just told me, this is, this is not good, this is not good, it's not evil, it's not evil. So I asked him, what is it? Because I was really desperate about my answers. And he told me that, uh, but this is a, I remind, a moral um, theology um, uh, uh, questions so, and answers. So maybe it's not worthy for the situation we live in. But anyway, it's a good. It's a good. It's it was a good um, example for me of how the way we can maybe think about evil. And he told me that the evil is the spam energy of creation of the world. Because when you are trying to make a table. So you need a wood to have a table, but all the other wood, it just falls down and it's useless. So he had this vision of a very uh, kind of William Blake's vision of uh, some great uh, architecture, architect who is making the divine beings or objects and the rest is just uh, mm -hmm. the bad things okay and i don't think that um, the let's say the neo-nazi voters in slovakia are specialized in moral theology <laughs> or i think that they don't even think about uh, what they are vo voting for as as being bad thing Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. we heard mm -hmm. today. They're not doing something evil be because it's evil. Yes, they are just not. They are not like a satanistic cult, you know. It's not the David Koresh sect or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, they don't believe in goodness. That's the that's their point. Mm -hmm. I think when you talk to them, they just say that we think or uh, that there is a ancient. Uh, idea of uh, mystical Judaism saying that there is a point in the world called Tikkun when God after the creation retrieved himself there to be safe and to observe his creation and there are many people in their language and their capacity are sharing this uh, idea that the goodness has been evacuated from the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And so there is no choice between mm -hmm. evil and goodness because there is no more goodness. Mm -hmm. It's the end of the old legends. Mm -hmm. The story doesn't go, doesn't um, end good anymore. It's, it's fascinating uh, um, approach. I, and I would like you to comment on this, Professor Margulit. Just one question. Um, as you say, most of the Nazi voters or the fascist voters here are probably not schooled in moral theology. But what caused so many people to give up their belief in the good? It's still me. Yeah. I thought I... <laughs> um, There is a, a very uh, well promoted postmodern idea from visual arts. When you turn on your Netflix or you go to the cinema, you can see the stories about evil, which is not longer in the world, but it's evacuated somewhere where finally it's not that harmful. Mm -hmm. It's just action, killing mm -hmm. each other, having a fun, flying if you are X-Men or burning your neighbor if you are whatever. So in um, imagination, the collective imagination of people who are fed with the uh, X-Men's uh, 
with Batman series, with uh, all these good things. I, I really like them. I appreciate them. But the idea is maybe that uh, evil was uh, placed and it's under surveillance in the movies and in the series. Mm -hmm. So there is not real evil. So if I vote whatever, neo-Nazi or populist or soft populist, it's not that guy, because the bad guy, the real bad guy, is Joker from Batman. Yeah. And Victor Orban is not Joker from Batman, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So uh, we keep him under the control yeah. in our imagination, and that's why we do not accept that evil, evil is, uh, um, can have a small, discrete appearances within us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Professor Margalit, uh, you see, we're meeting an intellectual from Bratislava here who easily moves from moral theology to Netflix, but he touches upon a few things that you've written about as well. Well, I make a distinction which has to do with the, with the evil, with banality of evil, mm -hmm. which was when Hannah Arendt coined the term, she didn't make this distinction, which I think is important, between instigators of evil and compliers with the evil. Mm -hmm. People who go along with the instigators. Most people who are compliers, and that's the majority, the overwhelming majority, are banal, ordinary people. Mm -hmm that in given circumstances they will go along. The point is whether the instigators are really entrepreneurs of evil. And I think that Heydrich wasn't banal in any way. I think, and, the, and those people who conceived of, let's say, of the Nazi mm -hmm. machinery uh, weren't banal. The, the one who confused, I think, Hannah Arendt was Eichmann. He looked to her like a, a, a shabby clerk of the kind that she, from her sort of snobbish upbringing, looked down at. But he, first of all, he was an interpreter of, of evil, entrepreneur of evil. Mm -hmm. He he studied Hebrew before the war in order to be a, to be efficient during the war. Even studied halacha, the Jewish law. He went to Palestine. He thought about the Madagascar plan for sending all the Jews. So he wasn't just someone who obeyed the law. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about evil, I think, and that's the, where the fascination comes, is the, with the instigators. But the main problem usually is the compliers that go along with them. They, they enable it. And could you follow Michal Havran when he says those compliers, let's say today the people who vote for populist or yeah. extreme parties, they lost their belief in the good? I think I make a distinction here which is crucial for throughout my work, between human-thin relation and human-thick relation. Mm -hmm. My attitude to my family is thick. There is history at it. There is a whole pride. To stranger, I have thin relations. Most people believe confuse. They don't see, th they think that ethics is all. And then I make that following distinction. Ethics is what regulate thick relations, friendship, uh, love, and so on. Morality is what regulate thin relations, the attitude to strangers that you don't know or don't meet. For many people, morality as an attitude to foreigners, to people who are not part of us, not, I'm not. They see, that's for them counts for very little. And they don't see the constraints that morality should put on ethics. Mm -hmm. They believe that, they, that ethic, to be ethical is not to be selfish. 
you are willing to sacrifice for your tribe, your nation, your religious order, or something. That's, you, I belong, and we have, are in thick relation. So most of the feelings that go here with evil go when you have ethics without morality. Right. Only thick relations count. Only my people count. The rest, let them rot. That's really, I think, the main hold. People, it's not whether they are evil by inclination or not. People usually are attached to the people to whom they think they belong. Yeah. And the point is, what about the people who don't belong? Right. That's really where I put the stress. That's why immigration is such exactly. a case in point. Immigration, membership, belonging. Right. The thin relations right. that we, without them, we will end up in flames. Right. Thank you, Michal Havram. I will, you I, I will Thank ask you, you to, to, to leave the stage in this marathon in order for us to invite the next guest. Thank you so much. We will, we will, of course, see everybody at the end again. But now we're going to be joined by Keith Lowe. <clears throat> Keith Lowe is um, a British author and historian. Mm, he's written novels, but he's written also three books about the Second World War and its aftermath. Um, basically making the point and, 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 and arguing the point, cementing his point through all, all the research that he does, that this war made the modern world, the world we live in today. Um, the Fear and the Freedom has just been published in Slovak, I believe. Is there anybody here who's already read it? You will. <laughs> ah. Give them time. <laughs> sure, it, it, it was just out, you know, it's slower. I read Savage Continent, one of the other books, um, and I want to introduce you by quoting a short story that you, that you mentioned in this book, which also explains why it is very important for you that we have you here and that you can go into conversation with Professor Margalit. So Savage Continent is about a lot of stuff I didn't know about what happened immediately after the end of Second World War, how victims be became perpetrators and vice versa. Um, it's very sensitive, it's very controversial material. It is uh, an episode in our history that we prefer not to talk about, but it's influential to this day. In this region, for instance, in Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, you have gone into what happened to the Volksdeutsche, the ethnic Germans. Uh, and you describe episodes that I really was not aware of, of, of mass beatings and rape and executions, including women and children, between roughly May and October 1945. I stumbled in, into this story. I want to read it to you because it's relevant to here, of course. Um, a Czech officer stopped a train filled with Slovak Germans under the pretext to identify former Nazis. So this happened immediately after the war. That night, his soldiers killed 71 men, 120 women, and 74 children. The youngest was an eight months old baby. They were buried in mass graves. Later, the officer justified the murder of the children by saying, what should I have done with them once we had killed the parents? This is the atmosphere, this is just one of many, many, many stories. This is the atmosphere that you describe, the, 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 the events that you describe in this book. Mm. So you describe a period of evil, of evil that is not being discussed very often, but also of an evil that, that comes out of revenge and that is to an extent justifiable after having gone through the horror of 
Nazi occupation. From that perspective, when you've gone into the reasons for people to, to butcher others, does that help you understand how a good person becomes evil? Uh, yes, <laughs> it does. Uh, although I, I, I prefer to look at it, I prefer to look at it the other way round. Actually, usually when when whenever I talk about these things, I, I try to look first at the revenge, and then go back to the reasons why. And 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 the reason for that is that. It, it sets up a, a different way of thinking about it, you know. So rather than thinking, okay, this evil was done to us, and therefore we are justified, you start off with the thought, we did evil. Why did that happen? And then go back. So, so you, I think it's important to start off with the things that we did, and then move move back towards mm -hmm. the reasons why that happened. What they did to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. After having followed this conversation, do you have a question or a response to Professor Margalit? Yeah, I do actually. I, I, I was thinking, um, I wondered, uh, we, I heard you speak a lot about fear. Um, we've all, all been speaking a lot about fear recently. Last night I, I was at another uh, talk in the other venue and there was a lot of speak about fear. Um, my recent book, as as you mentioned, is called Fear and the Freedom, and I actually want to ask you about the freedom side of it. I mean, fear is quite clear. When when someone's afraid, they act in a way which can be uh, illogical, um, violent. Um, but what about the freedom? Freedom has this sort of lovely ring to it, doesn't it? It's, it's something we all want. We think that it's uh, this wonderful state that can be achieved. Um, but actually, when if you are completely free, if you are free to do anything, I, I, I feel that's where evil is allowed a sort of foot in the door, isn't it? I mean, all our institutions which are created in order to, to prevent us from being evil, police forces, governments, judiciary, whatever, are, are there to limit our freedoms, aren't they? So w what I wanted to ask you is, how does how does freedom work in in creating evil and where if you're going to limit freedom where where do you draw the line you are absolutely right obviously we want other to have fear and us having freedom that's that's for sure i think that the understanding of that's i think that Perhaps the greatest mind in moral philosophy is still Immanuel Kant, and he exactly dealt with this problem of freedom and freedom and morality. And the idea is that only rational people that understand that others have the right that you have and treat others as persons and equal, that all, that's already limitation of our freedom. So only a diabolical creature have no constraints. We obviously have constraints from the mere fact that we live in a society. And if we take also the idea that rational people who have respect to others they already are limited by the existence of others. So it's not a war of all against all. It's living in societies that constrain us. The point is, what is we still believe that we are free if we do constrained rationally. If you are a mathematician and you follow logically a proof you are constrained. You cannot say I'll be free mathematically to come up with whatever I want. You are severely constrained by logic. You do it freely. You are engaged in this practice and do it freely. So the idea of free in the sense of being wild and being alone 
sort of in this kind of narcissistic fantasy or, or self-sistic, I'm the only one in the world, I do whatever I want. That's freedom. That's not even, I think, kids of, 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 of a certain age get rid of this uh, fantasy and know that there are others. So I don't believe that this is, uh, this is the way, I mean, how to give an account for it, that's a serious matter. As to fear, I think that there are rational fears. If, I, if, there is a, if I'm here and if there is only a tiger with me, I'm rationally, I, I'll be terrified and rationally so. Uh, if I just do to the tiger, come, come, let's see you, that, then I'm crazy. So the issue is whether the fear is rational or irrational. Not to be afraid when you have reasons to be afraid, that's a bad thing. And we are talking about irrational fears and the idea that it's easy to stir people and navigate them and challenge them into irrational fears. That's, and that's a basis of a great deal of evil, namely the fact that you create fears. Yesterday I heard someone here on the podium saying that uh, artificial intelligence is worse than nuclear warfare. Then you don't know whether this is expression of artificial intelligence, what you prefer, artificial intelligence to natural stupidity or, or what exactly? I mean, then you really are baffled. <laughs> So this kind of fears that artificial intelligence is worse than nuclear weapon, that's something that you don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. This image of the mathematician might have offered you a bit of an answer to your question. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm aware, as, as you mentioned, I've, I've written novels before, but also written history books. and. Uh, you have <laughs> when you're faced with a blank page, um, you can write anything. You could, you could, you could, if, especially when you're writing fiction, you're free to write anything. But the, the really, you, you, you can't get anywhere unless you start producing constraints for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first job of any writer is to define what exactly it is they're going to write about. And so immediately you're putting constraints there on your own freedom of your own volition, because it's necessary. You're, you're obliged to do this. And I think, I, I agree with you, I think we, we, it's the, the, we, rational people are obliged to place constraints on, the, on, on their own actions and their own thoughts. And um, I think the reason we have institutions is to impose constraints on those who are not so happy to uh, mm -hmm. be rational. <laughs> Unless the institutions themselves become evil. And yes, yes. Although, um, there again, it depends what you mean by an institution, I suppose. Uh, uh, if you look at what happened during the Second World War, for example, um, the reason why evil happened was that there were no constraints upon the institutions. Mm -hmm. And there were no constraints upon the individuals who were acting in the name, of the, the name of those institutions. So those constraints were actually removed. I mean, I, I think it's important that we have um, institutions which balance one another. So we have an independent judiciary, we have an independent uh, press, and we have a government who is voted for. And I think also, speaking as someone who uh, comes from a country which is about to leave the European Union, I think it's important we have international uh, constraints on, on individual government. So we, there should be mm -hmm. layers of government, local, national, supranational. Mm -hmm. These are checks and balances which prevent any one individual institution from overstepping its okay. mark. The problem is, as, as you mentioned, um, is when people want to bypass those institutions and go straight to someone who's going to act in their name 
in a way which uh, reinforces their prejudices and so on. We are, yeah, go ahead. No, you, you raised the, the issue of <clears throat> the behavior after the war towards the German population and about revenge, whether people justify usually revenge by uh, rough justice. I mean, it's not, the whole point was that political institutions, especially the state, confiscated revenge from individuals to act and created monopoly of power. That's the main attribute. But let me, eight million Germans were expelled from Prussia and then to make room for Poland. The Russians never gave back to the Poles what they took in the partition of Poland between them in the Rivent Molotov Riventrop Agreement. And they compensated it by expelling eight million Germans, million died on the way to Germany. Three million in the Sudeten Germans, million and a half in the Hungary and other parts. Those are momentous numbers. And of course, at least among my people after the war, the feeling, the need for revenge and the mad about, I mean, the horror was immense. Yet, I think it's very important to bring those cases to uh, something really horrible happened there. And these acts of revenge were horrible. Like, like the bombardment of Dresden. The un, sort of indifferentiated bombardment of German cities. So I think that that's for the moral record of the world. We have to deal with those cases and not just ignoring them and have a, a clear, a sort of a, a, a clean bill of health by saying, well, it was a revenge. And I think that's, in that sense, I think that's very important dealing with the evil on those sides of us. Mm -hmm. Moreover, the people, some of the people who were involved, like Churchill, were noble people. But the order to, he was an instigator in the bombardment of German cities indiscriminately. So those cases, I think, should be on the record in our discussion and shouldn't be sort of swept aside. That's I, mm -hmm. I completely agree. Gislo, what is your experience so far um, bringing these very uncomfortable um, events back into our consciousness today? Um, does, the, does the unearthing of these events, the speaking out about e these events, the acknowledging of these events, does that, how do you say, does that have the potential to, to, to bring the impulse for evil to a closure? Well, there's a question, isn't there, over whether, uh, <laughs> how much to remember and how much to forget, isn't mm. there? Um, you know, uh, the, um, some, sometimes the remembering of past sins is, is enough to rekindle um, those emotions all over again and the cycle of vengeance can start, all, you know, start again. I mean, we saw that this happen in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were singing World War II songs when they went in to, to massacre uh, people in, in Srebrenica and so on. Um, so, but the alternative to forget to try and forget and, and move on to the to the to a sort of golden future with and deny that the past ever happened is not really possible i don't think mm -hmm. i mean if you any any person who's been through a trauma will will know that uh, you know it doesn't matter how much you try to forget it it's it's always there it's always going to affect you whether you, whether you like it or not mm -hmm. and the second world war was a massive trauma mm -hmm. particularly for europe but for the world as a as a whole it was a it was you know, a, a part of our history which killed 
1% of the world's population, or more, even more than 1% of the world's population. This is, this is a trauma. Mm -hmm. So to try and pretend that it didn't happen and move on is, is not viable. So I think the only way really to sort of make sense of it is to, is to look deeply at the history and, and look it in the face, you know, look at it, look at it for what it is, not for what you would like it to be, not for uh, what fits in with your own sort of feelings of national coziness or, or whatever, but to look at, I think, first of all, to look at what you did. Mm. I think that's the starting point. I mean, I, I, get, I get very upset with my own countrymen um, for the way they remember or don't remember the bombing war. I mean, you mentioned Dresden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our one act yeah, of true, contrition. True. We, we, put, we put all our, our, our guilt into this one thing called Dresden. Okay, we were bad in Dresden. We'll forget everything else. Yep. Um, but, you know, what about Hamburg? What about mm -hmm. Würzburg? What about yep. Darmstadt? And I mean, there are 200 cities I could name. You, you personally, you're not forgetting and you're not uncovering this material to rekindle. No, no, but, no. But you do feel the personal motivation behind everything you're saying. You wanted to, to respond to that. I'll respond with a story that we cannot escape, really, this bloody war. Just before I came here, two weeks ago, there was a television program uh, an Israeli one, they brought some an item from the United States. And there was a, a famous actress. I'm not well versed in the Hollywood world, but she's her name is Scarlett Johansson. And uh, there is a program which is called PBS Root, that celebrities find their roots. And she ended up by, I mean, she followed her mother's track. Her mother, last name is Schlumberg. Not Johnson, not, Dan not anything Danish, Jewish. And then it turned out that she ended the memorial place in Israel, reading a document that my mother wrote in 1956 about it and it turned out that my grandfather is the brother of her great grandfather <laughs> of this scarlet johnson i can see the resemblance <laughs> and uh, she said and she read there about now my family there the clan consisted that's what i knew about 300 people roughly eight survived the war. That's what I knew. And therefore, I mean, when we talk, I mean, we, but now suddenly you see, I mean, things that never occurred to you. And the last thing I would have thought in the world that then Scarlet Ingrid Jönsson is related to me, blood related to me. So as you can see, you cannot escape it. Yeah. You can try, yeah, why would you escape being related to Scarlett Johansson? No. That's what I thought. Yeah, I agree. But, Keith Lowe, to return to what you just said, um, personally, I sense immediately the, the strong personal motivation between uh, behind uh, what you're doing, what you, why you're trying to do this. Um, does your work trigger others? Yes. Can you talk about that? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I too will tell a story then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to Poland to um, publicize the Polish edition of Savage Continent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is a, a chapter in the book which is about how Jews returning to Poland after the war, this is in 1945, 6, 7, uh, again encountered horrific anti-Semitism, uh, were beaten, were robbed, 
killed, and the, the famous uh, Kielce pogrom, pogrom um, sort of instigated a, 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 a really a, an exodus of Jews mm. from Poland. About 300,000 Jews left Poland after the war was over. So anyway, I, uh, I, I mentioned this in, in the book. I, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, a couple of pages. In the rest of that chapter, I spoke a lot about Hungary because I mm -hmm. thought, you know, people know about mm -hmm. Kielce, they know about Poland. Let's let's talk about something they not they don't necessarily know know about. So I spent a lot of time talking about anti-Semitism in Hungary after the Second World War was over, supposedly over. Anyhow, most of the people who asked me about the book were, you know, they were just standard interviews. You go along to these things and you get the, the same questions again and again. You, you begin to recognize them. You can begin to recognize your own answers. Um, you say the same thing again and again. But then this uh, a nationalist newspaper um, was due to interview me. Instead of one journalist arriving with his tape recorder, like as usual, three mm -hmm. arrived and sat in a row opposite me. And they were big. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't big, but they were obviously, they, they were on some kind of a mission. Mm -hmm. you know? And I could feel the atmosphere when they walked in, that there was something strange here. This wasn't, this wasn't what I was used to at all. They grilled me for one hour about the single page in my book where I mentioned the Kielce pogrom. They weren't interested in anything else. Mm -hmm. And they were incensed that I should talk about Polish anti-Semitism. Uh -huh. They didn't want, they, they said, everyone talks about Polish anti-Semitism. What about what the Nazis did? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, I was gobsmacked. Of course, we all know what the Nazis did. And they want, they, their, their mission, it turned out, was they wanted me to admit that I was wrong and that I had made some sort of mistake and, and that really uh, I should have been talking about how Poland was the victim mm -hmm. and not the Jews, mm -hmm. and, and really this was just a sideshow. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You, 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 you present something which is, has got huge amounts of evidence. It's documented. It's not, not my evidence. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lay claim to it. It's, I was quoting hundreds of other people. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. The evidence is not is not interesting. They don't they, they don't want to know what the facts are. They they have this deep feeling, and they want their feeling to be reinforced. Mm -hmm. Now, did this um, um, produce an interview or a report in the paper? It did. It, uh, they 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 uh, produced a book review. I, I, I never saw it, so I assume it was a bad one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is an example of what you. Describe and what you try to 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 work against this myth building. Yes, that that's always there, of course, to 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 keep let's say the hegemonic community together and to keep everybody else out. Well, not necessarily, because myths they don't have to be exclusive myths. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole myth behind the European Union, for example, is is one of us all working together to build True. something together. True. So, I mean, you know, this is a myth, just like any yeah. other, but it's a constructive myth. So yeah. you you can have constructive as well as yeah. sort of uh, negative myths. Yeah. Good. Now, to continue, um, thank you very much, Keith Long. I promised, I promised ourselves a short break at this moment, but I sort of feel that we should continue because otherwise there will be no time at the end for questions from the audience. So it's either this or that. Uh, and I feel we, we are really, really doing a serious attempt here to, 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 to circle around the phenomenon of evil. And I would actually prefer to continue if that's all right with you, Professor Margalit. Mm -hmm. I'm here. You're here? Good. Thank you, Keith. I will, I will then invite our next guest. We'll just continue so that you will have some space afterwards to respond to everything that's been said here. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
of course, people who want to go to the toilet or smoke a cigarette, in the meantime, you're always free to do so. Um, next up, I would like to ask to the States Haris Pashovic. He's a director of films and theater and festivals in Sarajevo and beyond. He's been here before, including performance last year by his own East-West Center. He was the man who invited Susan Sontag to, to Sarajevo during the siege um, and organized the first film festival there in a city without electricity. Haris Pasovic. Um, he also created the unforgettable image, talking about remembering, the unforgettable image at the commemoration of 20 years after the siege of Sarajevo with the 11,541 red chairs snaking all through the main streets of Sarajevo to commemorate the victims of the war. Uh, Haris Pasovic. Hello, hello uh, everybody. Now I'm the one that to blame for you not having a break. Mm -hmm. But I smoke too. So, you know, this is punishment for me as well. Mm -hmm. mm, you've been listening to this conversation. Um, you know a thing or two about, about evil, about massacre, about genocide. Uh, you know a thing or two about um, evil from the outside and evil from the inside. Would you like to respond or to ask Professor Margalit anything after what we've been discussing here today? Professor and I uh, established that we agree about the most important things. That's that Edin Maybe Jacob... Maybe it's wise to move a little bit here. Yeah. Because of, of the... Yeah. microphone. Mm -hmm. Is it better now? Yeah. So we agreed that Edin Dzeko had the best season uh, in, in Roma this year, mm -hmm. football player from Bosnia, and professor is keen um, fan of football, mm -hmm. me too. Um, so we also agreed, uh, um, and professor put it, may I quote you, uh, that in America, uh, uh, capitalism is um, for the gains, and socialism is for the losses of the rich. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think you know that more or less we, we mm -hmm. agree about other issues as well. Um, one question that I would like to, 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 to um, suggest for all of us to consider, because you know this question, how the, 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 the good person turns evil, um, we, it's 21st, for five years past in my country. Mm -hmm. So we already dealt with this, with this question 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we are dealing with a question that I guess you will be dealing um, in the future, how an evil person turns good. Mm -hmm. And is it possible? Mm -hmm. So, because we live with the um, with the with the guards of the concentration camps in the same apartment blocks, mm -hmm. um, it's not unusual <clears throat> that the rapist and the victim of the rape live in, in the same village mm -hmm. or same city. Mm -hmm. When you buy uh, honey on the marketplace, it might be well that you are buying honey from a mass murderer. So we, that's what we are concerned about, more about that than, than, than uh, about the first question. And um, there is a very prominent case of a man who claims that he turns good. And uh, in, in, in the early 90s, uh, he was even more radical than Milosevic. He was a young member of, um, uh, I mean, completely extremist party, and his name is Alexander Vucic. He is now the president of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, yeah, during the attack on Srebrenica, he was uh, the, the MP uh, in Serbian parliament, and there is a video recording on him, on, uh, of him saying, uh, for one dead Serb, we will kill 100 Muslims. In the meantime, 
he distanced himself from his past. He became um, a very successful uh, politician in Serbia and in the region. He said publicly that he was saying very stupid things, this is quote, in the past, but that he, is not, he has not been saying these things in the last five years, uh, that only donkeys don't change their minds. And as a matter of fact, he is now the most politically stable politician in the region with a 65% of the vote. His um, nationalism really scaled down very much. Um, he is very constructive as a peacemaker in the region. Mm -hmm. He also appointed a first woman as a prime minister in Serbia and Serbia is a very patriarchal society, but this woman also is gay, uh, which is equal to, I mean, impossible. Uh, he, in Serbia, that's, that's not, I mean, until yesterday, Serbia was the dark place where, where the anti-gay demonstrations destroyed mm. Belgrade, mm. and today you read on the cover page of the most circulated newspapers that the prime minister with her fi a female partner went to the theater and you feel like you are in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, that, that, but that's what's happening. Um, so um, he really uh, acts constructively about Bosnia. He acts uh, in a constructive way about Kosovo. And um, I believe that he will get the peace prize, Nobel Peace Prize in the future. Mm. Now, burning question. It's, it's fascinating to turn the original question around uh, because, of course, can an evil person become good? To what extent are you able to believe Vucic, to believe that he actually is learning moving in the direction of good it must be hard yeah. all my all my uh, belgrade uh, friends liberal friends they are crazy you know about who they they think uh, they think he's complete liar he's autocrat he's totalitarian um maybe i don't know and it does really doesn't matter what i think mm -hmm. whether he's he he is lying or not you know but the thing is that he is acting in a constructive way, right, right. and if he gets Nobel Peace Prize mm -hmm. uh, resolving Bosnia and Kosovo and Macedonia and makes a permanent peace in mm -hmm. the Balkans, I am fine. Scum. I am fine. Yeah. I am fine with it. For sure. I will, but I want to ask you and Professor Margalit, I'm not asking only about your opinion about Vucic, but about our capacity to let's say, to, to invite a one-time even evil person back into our sympathies, our circle? I'm not a priest, so, and I'm not even a believer, so I don't know. But, I mean, the priest would say, of course, that's, that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. Mm. Uh, so I think that forgiveness is a very... Um, r spiritual um, value, mm -hmm. especially in Christianity, um, but all in other religions too. So this, but the, the problem is how to apply forgiveness in advance. Mm -hmm. So you forgive somebody that he will do some crimes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's probably not possible. I don't know. I don't know if there is such a it's too complicated question. for me. Professor Margalit. First of all, I think there is a great deal to learn from the priests, namely the idea of repentance and forgiveness, namely that people can change radically and return back and behave differently. I think this we, sh we should take very seriously. And, but the point is whether there are unforgivable crimes. 
remember in the Karamazov brothers, the mother who's one of the la landlords sent her, sent his dogs to turn her baby to pieces. And so that's an unforgivable crime. The point is whether there are cases of unforgivable crimes. Usually, I mean, the whole idea there that you can make a distinction between the sinner and the sin. We should hate the sin, but love or at least accept the sinner under certain condition of repentance, of turning away. And I thought about the following thought experiment. I didn't know about, I would have used your example, but I used it now. It's troubled me. I mentioned already Mengele. But suppose that Mengele in South America, the countries where he was, Argentina, Peru, whatever, would have behaved like Albert Schweitzer, utterly in the service as a doctor of the natives, maybe even be a racist. Schweitzer was a bit of a racist, but then looked after the people in the grave and behave for 30 years or whatever, 40 years, would have been exemplary Albert Schweitzer. Would you then be able to forgive him for what he did in Auschwitz? And my answer is no. My answer would have been this was an unforgivable. In the case that you describe, namely, the cases of, basically the cases of, that we live in this imperfect world of amnesty. Amnesty actually comes from the same root in Greek with amnesia, with forgetting. We just make a point, we don't mention, we don't act on what happened. And in many cases that were, unre I mean, for the sake of peace, the generals in the junta in Argentina, the junta in Greece, and so on, people who committed crimes, whether to, all right, for the sake of peace, we shall go along. This is really tough. And in this case, if he participated, the way to describe is for Nietzsche, actively, mm -hmm. I would take it as an unforgivable sin. Maybe I'm not a priest, but uh, I would have taken how I would, I mean, I agree that there are mitigated circumstances that you mentioned, but yeah, this would have been a real problem for me. And if we do not think in a religious context, if we do not think in a judicial context, who decides what is the boundary between a forgivable crime and an unforgivable crime, and on what basis? Mm -hmm. First of all, who decides? I mean, you have to decide for yourself. What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Each one of us has to make this decision. What are, especially if we, do, we are not in power, we just have a judgment here. And uh, I think cases that became signposts of inhumanity are not just crimes, and that's the, but especially what we call crimes against humanity, they undermine the very project of morality. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they're very bad of killing people. But there are those cases, and that's, I think, what Nazism was about. Mm -hmm. They undermine morality itself. But there, are, there is the master nation, the others are not human beings, basically. 
slaves should be subjugated, be slaves, the Jews should be excelled. They undermine morality itself. Mm -hmm. When you face a crime which has this flavor of undermining morality itself ideologically, combined with action of that kind, that's the limit. Mm -hmm. So inhuman action, literally inhuman, namely that you don't treat others as human, those, are, I think, are the extreme cases mm -hmm. of the unforgivable. Mm -hmm. Aris Pashevich, you must be familiar with these very, very complicated choices to make because, yes, you run into people who have done the unthinkable. And Professor Margalit says you, you, you decide as an individual. Can you go along with this, this, this idea that unforgivable is when it, when it, destroys the very core of humanity. In other cases, I can consider forgiveness or, let's say, repent. I think it's paradoxical, like uh, most of the most important issues in our lives. Um, in a philosophical sense, Professor is completely right. Mm -hmm. um, in anthropological sense, you know, I mean, we can we can even get bro broader and talk about individual cases. I cannot forget for forgive somebody somebody the crime that he committed against you. I mean, who mm -hmm. am I to forgive on your behalf and so on? But mm -hmm. there is also real life and in the political sense you know i mean it is unforgivable what the whites did in africa it's unforgivable in that sense we shouldn't talk ever to the british to the dutch to to the belgium you know because it's unforgivable but at the same time we live in the world that 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 we have to somehow overcome this mandela after he was released, he came to London and sat in chariot with the British Queen and, you know, show symbolically that we have to move on. Um, I do understand when, when, when Keith is, is talking about the guilt of um, um, bombing Dresden and other cities, but I know the war would not be over if that didn't happen. So there are some, some things that are morally completely right, but that, 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 that doesn't work, in, uh, they don't work in, in, in real life, mm -hmm. in the political life. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted Belgrade to be bombed mm -hmm. because it, it meant that I and my family will be re released from a, from a 24 hours of threat to be killed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, that in a political sense, we have to, to swallow some bitter things in order to do a greater good, let's say. OK. Well, I mean, what you say, basically, it's true in in life, is it true in theory? Mm -hmm. I think in many cases, you have a small group of people doing the evil thing, let's say in South Africa, and a large community of whites that benefited from this small group that <coughs> did the evil thing. And there was something unfair to my mind in the truth and reconciliation con on concentrate of those who did the nasty stuff. And then the rest could say, well, I mean, they did it. We have nothing to do mm -hmm. with it. And there are cases when many people did the wrong thing and no one actually benefited, like in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And many people were involved. I don't know what it means to benefit the, the old. So how, whom, on whom we concentrate and what we concentrate about, those are, I mean, we should be very nuanced here. And it's case by case, I agree completely. Mm -hmm. When 
I mean, there are cases, however, I think that just to say practically we have to live with it, this won't wash. Sometimes you swallow lots of bad things just for the sake of future or sake of peace. But to blur the category, I think, to my mind, the things which are unforgivable, mm -hmm. that's a loss, a real loss. Mm -hmm. And here we may differ about cases by cases, yeah. but that's my, yeah. my view. Thank you, Aris Basvich. Thank find, you. I find this really, really fascinating. There is, this is so existential what we're talking about right now. Um, and I know you're anything but um, a pra pragmatic person. I know that you are a very, very principled person who will, um, as Professor Margalit says, always take case by case by case and be unforgiving if it is the choice you have to make. Always. So thank you for that. I hope you're still with us. Some people obviously uh, will not stay for the whole session, but I hope most of you are still with us. Um, it is it is a kind of labyrinth of of questions and themes and topics that Professor Margaret and our other guests are helping us go through. And I I believe we 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 are approaching maybe even attacking evil from all sides. We will do so now with Rasha Khayat. She's a Saudi Arabian German writer and translator. And she grew up in both countries. She lives in Hamburg now. Please welcome Rasha Khayat. Do yourself a pleasure and read uh, the West Oestliche Diva, her blog, because this is a fascinating uh, uh, account of living. The, I mean, you're 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 an intermediary of cultures. Um, so I'm day, told, at least all day long. Um, studied comparative literature, Germanistic, and philosophy. Um, your novel has been published in German. I haven't been able to read it yet, but I understand Weil wir längst wo anders sind uh, is a story of mixed identities, of the ambivalence of living between two cultures, of being a member, of, of asking yourself, uh, am I a member of this society or that society? Um, and of course, you also describe the, the stereotypes, the racism, the xenophobia that you meet because you never fit in, because you never fit into any uh, um, category. Except that you claim yourself to be the world's biggest David Bowie fan. <laughs> this is true, yes. Okay, this is this a fact, yeah? Uh, this is a fact, yes, okay, good. absolutely. Well, that's good to know. You've been listening. You, you've been... Uh, 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 writing about these themes. What would you like to present or to ask to Pro Professor Margaret? Well, we've been um, atta um, attacking or um, touching on all sorts of subjects uh, towards this evening. And mm. uh, as a matter of fact, the question I had in mind had just been asked uh, because I also wondered uh, about the rever uh, reversion of the question of mm. the fact if a good person can, not of an evil person, then can turn good. But um, while Keith was talking, I actually uh, something came to my mind that happened to me which was quite similar um, I recently got invited to contribute an essay to an essay collection uh, this essay collection came out uh, in honor of the anniversary of the Reformation as you know uh, Luther and the and the thesis and everything so when I got invited to do that my first response was um, what do I have to do with the Reformation um, I am neither a Christian nor a particularly a believer and I'm not a scholar which uh, also incidentally makes me feel woefully underqualified for this panel um, but um, so I got talked into contributing an essay because the people who um, complied this collection happen to like what I write about which is um, other than my literary work um, 
mainly pointing out racism and um, all kinds of injustices in, in Germany, in the German society of now, particularly, as I'm not a historian. So what happened was I got invited uh, to an event to read this essay. And the essay has the title, Quit Being in Denial, Germany is a Racist Country. And um, what happened was I read the essay and I always introduce it with all kinds of numbers also because I try to cover my bases. So I give numbers of uh, not only um, human racism and violence as in, you know, the, the, the uh, number of, of, of violence against refugees, against foreigners, which is increasing frighteningly in Germany, but also... Um, structural racism, which means that um, pers a person of color, a person of foreign background will always have a worse chance in the job market, will always have worse chance um, to, to in housing, in social benefits, uh, what have you. So um, I read this essay and afterwards a woman came to me, which is what made me think uh, when you were talking, uh, fuming, and an older lady mm -hmm. came to me fuming and she was waving a newspaper. Um, which had the, the, the article that said, oh, Rasha Hayat is going to read, blah, blah. And she marked the, the title of the essay. And she came to me and waved this newspaper in my hand, uh, in my face and said, um, oh, the only reason I came here, I really wanted to say, you're wrong. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, you think? So, um, but actually, I'm glad you brought some numbers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for waiting, for having, you know, talked. So, but she was very visibly upset by the fact that I said Germany is a racist country because she kept repeating and repeating that, uh, how dare I say this? Me, the, the foreigner also, you know, how dare I, the person of color, person of, of a different background, accuse this holy land of Germany of racism. Um, and she has been working with uh, foreign children and refugee children, which is always the argument that people bring to mm. me. You know, I work with refugees. I cannot possibly be a racist. Um, so, um, uh, and, and then what I did see was that she had an AFD button on her, on her bag. Like, mm. you know, this is the right-wing party, mm. which is now in the parliament. Um, so... What I would really like to know is, um, because we've been talking about good and evil all, all, all day long, um, but uh, what I'm missing is a proper definition, as a matter of fact, of, evil, of what an evil person or a good person is. Because this grandmother, I, I suppose she's probably mm. a grandmother, you've mm. been talking about thick and thin relations. She's, I'm sure she's a nice person to her children, to her grandchildren, and yet she has no problems whatsoever coming to a uh, cultural event um, attacking a person she's never seen before for being who she is and uh, also openly carrying her political preferences on her um, on her gear. So um, would that already qualify her uh, as someone who's sliding towards evil? Well... We don't confine evil, I think, just to action. I may be evil even if I do something even noble. If I volunteer the Red Cross to help people because I enjoy seeing people suffering, and that gives me a, an occasion to see the suffering I can be very helpful and be a good medic, but I think there is something twisted and wrong with my attitude and the glee and the joy I have from seeing other suffering. So I think we can be evil in inclinations, in intentions, in attitudes, and in action. And uh, an overall definition is just too hard. Religion dealt with the problem, what is called the problem of evil in religion, meant how come that God, which has three attributes, is omniscient, he knows everything, is omnipotent, he can do everything, and he's good, he's totally good, how come that there is evil in the world if God created with those three attributes? Either is then he's not omnipotent, 
or is not good, or is, doesn't know what's going on in the world. So for many years, this was the problem of evil. And the whole division and the whole theology was about this problem. Facing, especially from August and on, the idea of manichaeism that there are two realms, two gods, the prince of darkness and the good god. Now we are dealing with evil in a secular setup. There are underpinnings for this setup. For example, we talked about forgiveness here and other things. But we try here to make sense with the idea of evil within that secular context. And that's a new, that's not easy to sort out. Mm -hmm. That's not easy to sort out. But I don't know what's the definition of an elephant but I can identify elephant and talk intelligently about elephants. And most of the thing I really don't know how to define. Not a chair, not a table, and not the most common things. Mm. So evil is a, a particularly difficult thing to define. Are you, are you bordering on the statement that evil is evil once it turns to action? No. I said, no, no, I mean, no. as I described, I mean, this guy who works for the Red Cross, there is something evil in his attitude. Mm -hmm. Without actually, all the actions can be exemplary. I'm, I'm asking also, because of the story by Rasha, that this woman, it's, it's actually a fascinating question, is where's the evil? Where, where does she cross the boundary between being a good grandmother who works with refugee children and being a potentially violent AFD supporter? The issue is, in many cases, I don't have a definition, namely necessary and sufficient conditions to tell you whether something is within the boundaries or out. But I have paradigm cases, clear cases of what is evil. We all agreed that Auschwitz is evil by the definition. That's a clear case, whatever the definition is. The point about this woman, I don't know. I mean, she can be just misguided, can be, she can be just baffled. She, but in the end, it's, it's, uh, but in the end, uh, it, it's um, someone like her, the majority, um, who make it possible for these few people to sit in our parliament right now. That's why I'm asking. She's you know? the one of the compliers. Yeah, she's, exactly. She's mm -hmm. one of the compliers. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, she, um, if we stay with her for a minute, it's, it's not that she's uneducated. She clearly reads a newspaper. She clearly felt the need to challenge uh, someone uh, on something they wrote. So um, I'm one who's always advocating education. I work with children myself. I, I travel a lot, uh, mainly to Arabic countries and to Africa to, to, uh, to speak and to write and to encourage and inspire young people to, to go towards the path of knowledge and, and, and thinking and challenging um, ideas. So um, yeah, for me, it's still, I, I'm not sure. I um, think I think that in many cases, just I don't know anything about the woman you encountered no, from. Me neither. <laughs> but part of the story, I believe, is that you as a foreigner are ungrateful. Always. You know, that you are, un and you, I mean, if you were born German, you can complain as much as you, you are a nativist. You are exempt from being grateful. Foreigners, no matter how many years they are, no matter how they contribute, they are always in debt. They have to be grateful and show it. So she took your claim as being a case, you mm -hmm. shame the Germans and therefore you are ungrateful. Mm -hmm. Racism, I don't know, has to do with the idea yeah, well, racism in the strong sense means that I, there are some bad traits which are inherited and they cannot be changed. They're stable 
and immutable traits, bad traits that you have. If I believe that you and your children and so on will have those, uh, by the mere fact that you came from Saudi Arabia and you and Salman are the same, come what may, that's racist. Now there are cases that are more blurry. Yeah, well, I mean, we gave you here a place where our husband will look how you behave. That's basically, that's just a nasty, nasty way of behaving. Whether I would have called this woman racist, mm -hmm. the part is racist. And what she believes about this part, she believes that those bloody foreigners are ungrateful. Mm -hmm. We brought them here, look what they, we get from them. Um, Rasha, it also brings me to an issue we haven't touched upon so far, and I would like both of you to comment on that. How do you counter evil, racism, xenophobia, populism? Because going, writing an essay like that and going out to, to uh, speak with a title like that is an act of resistance to a growing uh, atmosphere in the country. Professor Margalit, you too, you, you, you spent a life working and thinking about how to counter these forms of evil. Can you both talk about that? My line is you act politically. Politics is the realm of countering. Mm -hmm. Not just be do good uh, mm -hmm. uh, preaching. You have to get organized politically and counter this party politically. I I'm a great believer in still in ordinary politics, in winning votes in demo by democratic means. So if you ask me, I mean, if evil, if you live in an evil regime where there is no way to replace, no way to express yourself. Then you, lots of things are very different. Mm -hmm. The way we live, I mean, the way we live, are such that my line is politics first. We cannot afford to lose faith in politics. Yes, that's 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 what I believe, and I know that that's that's people. Well, well it's all disgusting. The old Koran, all this anti-political attitude, mm -hmm. that's terrible. Mm -hmm. That's really what enables, that's really helpful for evil, right. for evil trends. Right. The disbelief in politics is already on the way of really not supporting evil, countering, but not countering evil. Osha? Well, um, as I said, I'm mainly a novelist, so um, I would qualify myself as an artist, so I am a firm believer in art and also in the fascination of evil, which incidentally is um, what I'm working on right now in my second book. Um, but as I said, I'm all for education. I love to work with young people, mm -hmm. with students, with children of all ages, of all races, of all um, social backgrounds also, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really not very familiar with uh, how the situation is uh, over here, but in Germany, you know, the, the gap is getting <coughs> increasing more and more. Um, good education is becoming more and more elitist. So um, I believe we, sh me personally, as, as someone who who's shares a stage with intellectuals and who's herself and considered to be one of them, um, uh, rightfully or not, um, has a has a duty to go to places like um, community outreach programs, teach teach children, talk to them, um, inspire them, and not only not in a politi political preachery sort of way, but I really do believe in storytelling, and I believe that storytelling. Um, can connect you with your fear, and if you face your fear in your storytelling, um, you're also probably better equipped um, to have to shield yourself against evil. Because I mean, as we heard before, uh, fear is is the basis of any sort of hatred, crime, mm -hmm. 
evil, basically. So um, I try and I write, I publish, um, and I try and inspire and educate. That's what I try to do. It's my little part. And yes, you're an artist, and yes, writing and educating is, is let's say, a constructive way to counter evil or, or even to prevent uh, people to become evil. I wouldn't evil. go that far, but... <laughs> but going out um, with an essay and a lecture saying Germany is a racist country, that is a step further. That's, a, that's, I mean, that's that's a big statement. That is, that's an act of protest. Yeah, I believe in resistance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's something that um, um, what I have seen in Germany over the past four or five years, I guess. I've been writing about this for five, six, seven years uh, for newspapers in my blog, as you've mentioned, essays and so on. Um, what I've seen is that Germany as a society is incredibly blind on that eye. Um, they, are re they refuse to acknowledge the fact that there's uh, such a thing as a racist underground or brown or nationalist um, underground uh, in deep in deeply embedded in the society. So I do believe in resistance and I do don't believe that we should leave it to the politicians, which I never want to be. I don't want to be a politician. Okay. Um, um, two, I, I, two of you together can save the world, I think. You think? No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think what we both have in common is probably we're both idealists from one, from mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. So um, as an artist, I think artists have a great tradition in being idealists and therefore resistant. So um, as long as I can speak and I'm allowed to, um, I will always go on any stage and point things out that seem to bother me. Um, and I try to underline that with facts and figures. Well, that's what I try to do. Thank you, Rasha Hayat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And final participant in this panel is Hamid Ismailov. I would like to invite you on stage. Uzbek writer and journalist, um, he had to migrate to the UK in 1992, long time ago. And here he is, under your applause, Hamid Ismailov. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here's a glass for you. Um, how much is my office is, is uh, no doubt the the the, uh, the widest read, the widest published author from Uzbekistan, beautiful, beautiful writer. I believe your novel, uh, The Dead Lake, has been published in Slovak, so you'll be able to read it. Um, at the same time, in his home country, Uzbekistan, the authorities have tried to erase his identity. They don't want him to exist, even. Uh, I read in an, in an interview with The Guardian that you described this like as follows. Nobody can mention my name in any article, review, or historic piece. I'm the most widely published Uzbek, yet nobody can mention any of my books. It's a total ban of my name, of activity, of books, of existence. It's as if I'm non-existent. And yet you're here. Thank you. Uh, it's about belonging, isn't it? Uh, so uh, there was a great poet, Nasimi, who said, uh, Two worlds are fitting inside of me, but I don't, don't belong to any of them. So <laughs> I don't belong to my own nation in that sense. So uh, it's a funny uh, thing. But uh, what I would like to discuss maybe, uh, you know, Yesterday, coming here, I was reading uh, uh, Al-Farabi, my compatriot. So at least you belong to your culture. So I was reading his uh, Al-Madina Al-Fadila, which is uh, about the perfect state. So he talks about the evil, how people become evil, how uh, uh, to revert it, and so on and so forth. And as a writer, what... Uh, uh, was striking for me uh, his notion that uh, evil is not a substance, which is sort of, you know, inbuilt into a person or whatever. And here, as a writer, for me, it's more interesting, you know, though you said about the evil that uh, uh, it's not just an action, yeah? When, for example, uh, you know, uh, an evil is in person, 
let's say uh, gluttony could become uh, just uh, uh, applying to yourself could become an obesity or uh, lust could become a masturbation and so on and so forth but it doesn't affect others so much but uh, as Uzbek say uh, club comes from two hands uh, what interests me uh, how evil is acting in this world you know and coming here I was thinking about the famous another compatriot of mine, Roman Jacobson, who uh, taught here and who came to this idea of uh, the communication between two people. Uh, there is this famous scheme of communication where he says about the uh, person, uh, the message, uh, the sender and receiver of the message, then the context, code and channel. So when you are applying the same model to the evil, it becomes much clearer the sort of, you know, the, the dynamics between the sort of, you know, perpetrator of the evil and the person, the, either the victim or the person on the receiving end of this evil. Mm -hmm. So you've got the context of this evil. It could be, you know, clear cut context like Rohingya, for example, situation or less obvious, for example, is Brexit evil or not? So. You can discuss that one, yeah, from the point of view of the humanity, maybe evil, from the point of view of Britishness, maybe it's a good thing, and so on and so forth. So you can uh, graduate, uh, sort of uh, gr give grades and shades and discuss. Uh, so the same is with channels, uh, the same is with the code channels, could be the party, uh, could be the movement, and so on and so forth. All these compliers, they are coming under different sort of notions, under different uh, 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 sort of places in this communication graph, in a mm -hmm. way. So you can understand much better the situation which is happening uh, when the evil uh, sort of interplays, you know, between the perpetrator and between the victim. So do you think that uh, this scheme of Jacobson is applicable to what mm -hmm. we are discussing? Uh, well, let's start with Al-Farabi, then we'll move to Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Al-Farabi and then Maimonides and Aquinas all got it. Uh, they got the idea that the answer to the theological question, how come that the good God, the all-powerful God, created evil? The question, he didn't create evil. Evil is not a substance in the world. It's not a thing in the world. It's privation, it's lack of something. So it's lack of perfection, lack of a good thing, and lack is not like shadow, it's not an, exi not an mm. existing thing, and therefore God is saved because it's only created privation and not substances. The question is why God, why it's a good world if there is this privation, why? That's a different question. So that was Al-Farabi, and it had tremendous influence and, uh, on, on, on world views and mm -hmm. on like that. Well, I mean, we can go into it, and I have something to say about whether the whole idea of privation holds water. If you, I mean, the idea is that if, you are, if I'm blind, I, I'm... It's privation because I could have seen, but you cannot say that it's a privation that the bottle doesn't see because it doesn't have the capacity at all to see. So there are many moves here which are very interesting, but I think we, the idea here, I, the way I understood, was more to the second move to the Jacobson move, mainly to the secular understanding. And Jacobson had this idea of six uh, parameters of, of communication. And one of them that you mentioned is keeping the channel open. Mm -hmm. He even brings a, if I remember, I mean, Dor a story by Dorothy Parker, where a couple, young, speak on the phone. And the whole story, there is no content, nothing happens, but how are you? Fine. Uh, not even fine. And you, 
all right, and, and then just the whole thing is this meaningless talk just to keep the channel open. Now, evil is not like that. It's not keeping a channel open. In evil, the idea is evil is not a message. It's a painful, mostly, it's painful. Yeah, it's an act. It's an act. Yes. It's, yeah. No, it's causing harm. Mm -hmm. And that's the main attribute of evil, causing what makes it evil. I mean, the genus is harm, what make, but deadness is also harm. So it's a particular form of harm. But first of all, there should be harm. And that I, describing it already in this model, make it part of a different move as if we live in worlds of representation, so not in a, mm. not in a first floor mm. world. How we represent evil, how we talk about evil, how we discuss. Here the idea was to talk about the reality of evil, <clears throat> namely how bad mm -hmm. it really is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whether it's Jacobson, who I knew, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and made a great impression on me. Uh, I, I, I think evil is not a communicative act. It may also be a communicative act, but that's not the main message. Mm -hmm. What is right about, and we didn't talk about it, it's very interesting that there are two ways of people to cause harm or evil, will evil. One is making the victim look inhuman. Muslims mm -hmm. decimating in sort of the way the people, inmates look in a concentration camp. So you don't treat them, they are dirty, look like skeletons, and therefore you can get rid of them almost in terms of hygiene not in terms of mm. morality. Another way of breaking the symmetry of humanity is making yourself wild, drinking alcohol, like Cossacks before pogrom. Mm. You, you drink, you're wild, or Mexicans in the Hollywood movies before they, they drink, and then they, so they break the symmetry mm. of humanity. Either I am not human, I'm a wild animal now, and I'm therefore allowed to do whatever, or you are not human. Mm. Because I think the whole idea is not, it's, a, it's to break the communication, really. Namely, I am not, uh, I'm, it's breaking the communication by breaking the symmetry right. of, of two communications. Yes, I do agree with you, but the, uh, what I'm trying to say, you know, the, the, the uh, act of evil is not just one way, sort of, you know, from perpetrator to victim. That is the, the you know, and me as a writer, for example, e, I am interested more, for example, in interplay between the victim and between the uh, perpetrator. There is always this, the second part. Uh, there is uh, not just second, maybe six parts of it, you know, as I am saying. There is this uh, channeling person, might be channeling the same, uh, in our case it was Eichmann, channeling person. There might, it might be a sort of, you know, ideology is the referential point of it, yeah. Uh, there might be a sort of, you know, coding people, for example, what happens in Uzbekistan is completely different to what happens in Europe, let's say. Mm -hmm. Different language, different sort of, you know, uh, uh, relationship. So there are g many gradations of this interact between the perpetrator and be between the victim. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, as a writer, I'm interested in that one, rather than just an evil person, mm -hmm. a dictator, you know, who mm -hmm. perpetrates his uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, evil upon the world. And um, um, let's say discovering this interaction between the victim and the perpetrator. And in your work, these shades of gray are all there. Um, what does it learn you about what it takes for a good man to turn into evil? 
You know, the main thing here, maybe it's the dynamics, you know, rather than a sort of, you know, we are the, the defining the evil and now we are done with mm -hmm. evil, mm -hmm. you know, the constantly changing dynamic. For example, we haven't discussed today the issue, for example, of, you know, our model, for example, of the sort of representation, yeah, the panel is talking upon the sort of, you know, uh, is changing rapidly now mm -hmm. with the Facebook, with mm -hmm. the Twitter, mm -hmm. with all these social social networks. Yeah. Now there is this process, we're talking quite a lot about the sort of, you know, about the emissions in the natural world, about the sort of climate change and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But we are not paying enough uh, sort of attention to the maybe inflation and uh, emissions of the uh, written word, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there is this inflation of word which is bringing then uh, this situation when, uh, for example, the populism starts to work and so on and so forth. I'm trying to compare myself to my prede uh, predecessors, yeah, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, etc., etc. There, what has been taken as the sort of sacred word, yeah, there mm -hmm. was the authority, the mm -hmm. moral authority. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. But the, unless uh, is you that know, a loss? Is that an inevitability? It, it, it's a dynamic once again. Mm -hmm. It's an act of balance in a way. On one hand, we are releasing, as you were saying, the freedom of the sort of you know of everyone to for his uh, uh, say in this world. But at the same time, the level of the noise is much bigger than the level of the communication in mm -hmm. a way. But you see, you come from Tashkent. Yeah. During the war, some of the people I talked about, friends of the family and so on, ended up in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. And one of them wrote a book, which was called Tashkent, the city of bread, yeah. Grossman. Because this was heaven. Tashkent during the war was the first time people saw vegetables and there was bread enough to eat. And they thought, they thought that in, they, for many years, Tashkent was a glimpse of paradise for the seven. Namely, in the Eastern Front and other places, the situation is such that you are wild and terrible. But now in Tashkent, it's peaceful and we can relate to other and people in the market are nice to us. And people were amazed by the color of the vegetables. Tomatoes, they never so red, sort of this kind of redness and so on. So, I mean, sure, the dynamics is really the story. I agree completely. It's really, it depends from where you came to what you came. But I'm struck that the same place yeah. that is now sort of a problem was a sort of paradise for- It's, it's quite problems. touching. And maybe it says something about our topic that at the beginning of the afternoon you spoke about Prague and the potential and the, the dream and what has happened today. And now you describe uh, Tashkent, which is today a city that will not accept you. Uh, so, yeah, and this was obviously romanticizing. For sure, you know, for sure. To eat, suddenly there was this kind of plenty. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't read it as a model mm. of the class. No, no, of course. And I do, there is one thing that, well, first of all, I have to say, I'm really grateful that you invited me to this, to this conference. I know that someone has to say it at the beginning, but then I'm saying it now, which means I mean it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. And the, and the thing about, the thing, there is a tendency in conferences like ours to be cultural pessimists. Mm -hmm. The world is going down. It used to be much better. The young don't understand. They don't share the values. The, 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 I think, I think that's a dynamics of conferences 
with usually abstract nouns like justice or evil or something. With abstract nouns, you usually will get cultural pessimism as a sort of as a side effect. I think that evil is a problem, and I mean in the world, but the last thing that I want to convey is as if the, we go downhill or uphill. We just go in circles usually, and I hope that there are enriching circles. Mm -hmm. But that's basically, I don't want to convey here anything which smacks of cultural pessimism. Well, thank you for that, because it's very true that we can slide into that all too easily. Now, you've been so concentrated, so patient. I'm sure you noted, just like I did, the number of very, very uh, um, beautifully phrased and thought through uh, arguments. You might also have some questions or comments. So can I ask somebody here to put a few extra chairs on the stage so that we can have everybody back? on stage. Mm -hmm. um, chairs are coming. And there's um, a microphone around for anybody who would like to raise their hand, ask a question, or place a comment. There's one coming up, there's one over there, there's one down here. Uh, but now, where's the microphone? Is it... Lucia or somebody else, is there a microphone on? The, ah, Pavo is getting the microphone. Great. Shall we um, start over here with one of the masterminds behind this forum, Milan Simechka? Thank you very much. I mean, now, my question will be very stupid. And the question is, is there any link between uh, evil and stupidity? And, and uh, goodness and wisdom. And who would you like to answer that question? Uh, it's up to you. No, no, it's up to you. Well, I, I, of course, I would like to, to hear mostly professor, but, but, but it's open for everybody. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> to both questions. The short and the long answer is yes. There you go. Um, over there in the middle. If people think that uh, there will be not enough resources for the self, including the abstract resources, uh, they usually decide to be evil. Um, it is possible to prevent this evil for atheistic people? Mm -hmm. Who would you like to answer? I'm uh, not sure which one has a good answer, so I cannot ask <laughs> to a concrete person. Okay. Who would like to go into this one? It's another fundamental question. Please look. Um, there is enough to go around, is my answer. Um, the people who think that there isn't enough, enough to go around are misinformed. Um, and, and it profits certain groups to, um, to produce this misinformation because, because they want to uh, have a, this kind of response. Well, I mean, that's all, all I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll expand on this a bit. I mean, economics was defined as the, the science of scarcity. That are scarce resources, therefore we have allocated 
we have to allocate our means to get the resources and the question is how to produce, how to distribute and so on. The point here is that all the evil cases that were attributed to nature like famine were, were done by human beings. That there was enough resources to distribute and human beings by their action prevented it from getting there or from doing it. The idea that nature already created all the catastrophes and therefore we are immune, in many cases that's not the case. I don't deny that tsunami is a natural force and I don't deny that there is drought. But if we don't respond to drought ahead of time, it's usually most of those cases are man-made and not natural, a natural phenomena. One down there. Sorry. Good evening and welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to raise one question, but I will say two or three sentences. I assume that most of us are here, maybe left of liberal or central liberal, or maybe very enlightened conservatives. But uh, when we are talking with neighbors um, who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum, how would you reframe arguments with them when we are talking about evil and goodness? Because in our individual worlds, we have certain small images of what is good and what is bad, because just through these small steps, we can achieve radical evil or radical goodness. Thank you. Um, I always find it very useful to ask people back. You know, if you have a discussion with your neighbor on, for example, a refugee situation or something, um, I always ask, so tell me exactly what have you been missing since the 800,000 Syrians came to Germany? Do you have a euro less in your bag? Do you have less food in your fridge? Like, and try, and I, I always try, I mean, I'm, I'm very bad at this and I'm trying to get better, be as, as non judgmental as possible. Um, and as not confrontational as possible. But the really useful thing I find to get a conversation starting is to ask someone, what's your concern? You know, um, I was at an event uh, yesterday uh, and there was talk about giving people space for their fear and giving people, people space for their anxiety without them feeling judged or being talked down to, which is a tendency liberalism has, you know, people uh, feel belittled by liberalism and by intellectuals. So if someone feels taken seriously with their concerns, I guess they, they are less, they are more likely to listen and to think. Um, so I would just suggest opening a non-judgmental conversation and trying to open a space for someone's fears and anxieties. And be patient with that. Keep doing it. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, can I just, can I just More answers. Though? Sorry. Yeah, I just yeah. want I just wanted to say that um, it's important to get to them before they've made their minds up. Mm. Because yeah. once they've made their mind up, there's, you, there's no changing it. Um, okay. I mean, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a famous uh, uh, a book called uh, Anti-Semite and Jew. And he said there was no point in debating with an anti-Semite about whether he was anti-Semitic. Because anything you say, it doesn't matter. It, it will just confirm what they already believe, mm -hmm. regardless of what facts you give them, uh, whether, whether you give them uh, evidence. They're not interested. They're not interested in facts or evidence. They've made up their mind. So it's important you, it, in order to get to them before they've made up their mind, it's really important not to put them off by yeah. calling them a racist to start off with or, or, or being angry with them. Or you have to, you have to be reasonable to begin with. Sorry? Ah, okay. No, no, the, the, the next question will be in Slovak. There's one here. Where, where are you going? Okay, but go. Sure, sure. 
We have the headphones. Thank you. I may speak here on behalf of those uh, few religious uh, people and conservatives uh, here. I believe that it is not possible to speak about good or evil outside of a religious context. I believe that in spite of all the attempts uh, throughout history to um, destroy uh, a religious view of the world and the life of people, I would like to go back to the history that the professor mentioned here, like um, Archangel Lucifer turned bad, evil. I also see the beginning of a problem of evil in uh, Lucifer having revolted against the authority. But maybe uh, the reason that he turned against the authority was first uh, jealousy, then uh, uh, it was turned into evil and he started to do evil, he started looking for allies, and uh, he attracted almost one third of all angels. And the same goes for human society. These are archetypes in our uh, human uh, nature, and uh, they, in my opinion, attract evil, and uh, this is subsequently disseminated into society at large, be it in a political or other sphere. Could you please anybody comment on this? You? I'm not so quite sure what uh, you meant. I can understand the imagery that you have used, but we have to keep in mind that these are metaphors or allegories from a certain period of uh, Mesopotamian shepherds. And uh, another thing, religious people like to pretend they have the exclusive right to uh, address uh, or to, to say what is right and what is uh, not right. I uh, have some uh, parallels in my experience of this. Uh, religious um, religions are very, are very violent and uh, um, they become very dangerous for society when uh, they uh, start to uh, be impulsions and uh, they have a destructive effect on people. And I uh, certainly would not uh, claim that uh, religious people are better than the others. Uh, I do not want to go into extreme and uh, to refer to Islamic State as an apocalyptic uh, cult. Uh, so to make it short, uh, the discussion about ethical things, about moral things, what is good and what is bad, it is very good that this discussion is not only limited to religion these days. And this is not really the answer, it's just my comment on uh, what you have said. Thank you. We have, we are, we're running out of time because the next program is at 7 o'clock, but the lady over there has been waiting for a chance all the time. So I would like you to ask the last question. You will speak in Slovak, yeah? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, I try to be concise. My question is probably to all of you, 
but if uh, there is not enough time, then it's addressed to Professor. We have spoken about moral theology. You may learn from fairy tales and biblical stories. Would it help us to have enough feeling? Would it give us strength to be able to resist stronger pressures, let's say, by politicians or other people? I mean, not everyone is intelligent enough. It is not that I would like to belittle someone, but not everyone has enough information. Uh, to be able to make a good conclusion, to choose a good authority or a appropriate politician. We have the stories of Samson and Delilah, and today he would be probably seen as a terrorist, no? Would that be a way to uh, educate yourself? You don't have to be a Catholic or a Protestant, but you may be searching for truth. And maybe all these books could give us a lesson or a wisdom about truth. And maybe also stories for children, fairy tales could give us this. We have a, there is a psychoanalyst in Germany who was originally a Catholic priest. And he had the same story, like our Archbishop Bezak, he was not tolerated by the church. Uh, because the church was not able to tolerate a person with a different view, but he continues his work and he does psychoanalysis to people who are searching, who are on their way, and he uses biblical stories to help those people. Do you think that would be a way? Do you have such an experience? Final words, Professor Margalit. I don't have this experience, but Tolstoy had it. And he wrote the biblical stories in a very simplified way in order to educate mainly mujiks. And uh, he thought that his stories and rendering his stories in this simple way is far more important than war and peace and Anna Karenina and all the rest. Thanks God that he wrote Anna Karenina and all the rest. But the question is, can, a simplified, can simplified stories with direct appeal to morality in certain age influence children? Yes. I wouldn't start with Samson and Delilah. Uh, that's basically an Hercules kind of story that penetrated the Bible. But there are some good stories. One of them is the Good Samaritan. And that's a good beginning. If I may add. Yeah, there are many ways. So obviously, I, I think that my answer to Milan's question is no. There is no connection between uh, a level of intelligence and uh, uh, whether a person is good or evil and so on. Uh, because certainly uh, uh, spare or, or, or getting, they were intelligent people. Yeah? But stupid people can be very good and can be very evil too. Uh, the thing is that I think that we shouldn't pretend that we are all goodies here. We, all, we are all good and evil. Emil Sioran uh, spoke on behalf of us saying that every night we imagine before we fall asleep our enemies to be torn apart. Mm. We imagine how we slaughter <coughs> their, 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 their necks. We are not good, nice, decent, center-left, little conservative, little this, little that. No, we are beasts too. So in order to tame this beast, certainly, maybe somebody turns to some spiritual stories, somebody turns to Rihanna, somebody turns to football. Uh, we have lots of ways to get, uh, uh, to get released our frustration, and I certainly know I would recommend uh, Rihanna. Yeah. <laughs> It's been it's been a long and fascinating and 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 incredibly clarifying ride. Uh, I hope you agree. Moments of deep wisdom, moments of real horror, 
moments of courage and of disagreement. Um, before I go to sleep tonight, I will hear all of you speaking to me again and again. But it leaves me, and it's very strange, but it leaves me with one image that I won't forget. I'm going to take this with me. And I don't know if it's going to end in good or in evil. Tonight, before I go to sleep, I'll imagine Avishai Margalit in the empty Astorka theater with a tiger and Scarlett Johansson. So, Michal Havran, Haris Pasovic, Rasha Hayat, Keith Lowe, Hamid Ismailov, and Avishar Magali. At, at seven o'clock, the program continues with the cabaret program Rendezvous in Bratislava, but it's not here, it's. Vague loop, in the vague loop, it's close. <laughs>